This is Dr. Don Boynowski for Blue Mountain Radio, KQBM 90.7. Today I'm going to be speaking with Dr. John Searle, Professor of Philosophy at UC Berkeley, where he began his career at the age of 26. He's the recipient of numerous awards and prizes in the field of cognitive science. Dr. Searle has published 18 books and countless articles on the structure of language, mind, and social ontology, and he's widely regarded and recognized as one of the world's great philosophers of mind and language. Welcome to the program, Dr. Searle. Shifting gears, that's, that covers a lot of material, but shifting gears, I think you once said that, that science is the most stunning intellectual achievement of the human race. Okay. And it's very, the past 300 years, it's really only uh, since the 17th century that we've begun systematically to improve our knowledge. And the most stunning fact about our intellectual life now is knowledge grows. It continues to grow. I mean, if uh, Descartes or Kant could go into a university bookstore today, they would be, their breath would be taken away by the amount of knowledge that we have. I'm reluctant to call it science because there's a kind of religion about science, but there is the, the set of techniques for investigating nature that evolved in the 17th century have given us spectacular results. And as you said, quoting me, that's our leading intellectual achievement, and that is the central intellectual of the present era. This knowledge continues to grow. Changing reality just by deciding to change it, is that something you once talked about? Yeah, I wrote two books about that. One is called uh, The Construction of Social Reality and Making the Social World. And the mar- remarkable thing about human uh, uh, a social reality, unlike other animals, is that we can create a, a set of real world objects, money and property and government and marriage, just by representing them as existing. So you create money by representing it as something as being money and so on with uh, marriage and governments and private property and universities and cocktail parties and summer vacations. All of those are created by a certain kind of linguistic representation, what I call a declaration, where we create something by representing it as existing. And then humans have this remarkable capacity uh, to create functions that people and objects can perform, where they can perform the function only in virtue of the fact that they're uh, the object or person in question is collectively accepted as having a certain status, the status of being money or the status of being a professor, and that will enable the object or the person to perform functions they could perform without the acceptance of that status. That is the foundation of human civilization. That's the way that civilization succeeds. So that said, what do you think is creating our current reality? Well, as all as in the past, what's growing is the use of language. Uh, no language, no government. You have to have a, la- a linguistic means of representing somebody as president if you're going to have a president, and so on with Congress uh, and all of the other uh, uh, off- offices. Uh, so our current reality is a historical product of a series of linguistic representations. Uh, sometimes these are explicit as in the case of the creation of the Constitution of the United States. Uh, other times they're quite implicit when you get to uh, social status hierarchy re- relations of an informal kind in- inside a, a community. But in every case, what you've got are linguistic representations that continue to create different statuses that people and objects have, and those are all about one thing. They're about power, these create these. Uh, uh, status functions, I call them, uh, the power, the powers that people have, both positive and negative powers. The president has a positive power uh, to veto legislation, and then he has an obligation uh, power to provide a State of the Union message. So all of these, now and in the past, indeed, I think in recorded human history, ha- have the same <coughs> logical structure or by, we create these status functions by representing them as existing. And do you see these, this moving into a more positive uh, direction for society, or do you think there's a, a corporate stranglehold on basically how we think in terms of how all this is being manipulated by, by large, um, powerful groups of people? Well, if we're looking at the long haul, uh, there's no question but what... Um, uh, we've uh, benefited enormously uh, by improvements in the human condition uh, due to the uh, uh, organizations. Democracy 
is uh, more pervasive than it's ever been. Uh, Europe no longer has the threat of immediate destructive wars of the kind that it traditionally had. Now, there are other parts of the world that are still pretty backward. We still have not brought them, uh, many of the Muslim uh, communities into full membership in uh, the 21st century civilization, and I don't know how that's going to turn out. But in the case of, for example, China and India, uh, they seem to become very much part of the uh, of the organized institutional reality uh, that I have been describing. So on balance, I think we're making enormous progress. Of course, it could all be blown up in a moment, but uh, look over the long haul, compare now with a couple centuries ago, there's no question that more people are better off than was ever the case in the past. So so are you generally... Do you, if you were to talk to your average scientist today, they seem to have a... First of all, they, they point, it might point out that no species has ever survived. And, uh, you know, why do we think we're different? Um, and yeah. then also, uh, they seem to be fairly pessimistic on uh, everything that's happening environmentally. From a cognitive yeah. standpoint, how would you sum up sort of where we're at and where we might be headed? Or is that a, too difficult? Uh, the two great dangers uh, that have faced us in, the, in my lifetime have been, first of all, the possibility of destruction, usually uh, due to nuclear uh, possibilities, and that seems less likely now than it was 40 years ago. Uh, but the other uh, possibility is we can poison the environment to the point where life becomes unpleasant or uninhabitable, and that's a real danger. We are continuing to pollute uh, the environment. A global warming is an established fact. I don't know how anybody can hope to deny that. Uh, it's not a, an established fact that it's mostly caused by humans, but it seems the most reasonable assumption, and even if it's not established, you still have to act on that assumption because you have to make policy based on preventing the worst possible outcomes. You have to minimize uh, the maximum risk, and in order to do that, we have to take steps to uh, curb the sort of air pollution that we're making. Now, about the end of the species, well, we know that's going to happen anyway. Our Earth is going to cool off in the end. And let's not forget, you see, we tend to exaggerate, but let's remember our little sun is one of a 100 billion stars in our galaxy. Uh, furthermore, there are a 100 billion galaxies. So we're at a rather tiny little suburban corner of the universe, and uh, we shouldn't suppose that uh, we're going to last forever or we're the only thing that matters in the universe, but we do matter to us, and I think for a for foreseeable future, uh, we can plan more intelligently than we have in the past. And I don't think we should worry about the fact that in millions of years from now, there won't be any people around like us because our Earth will cool off. And definitely the case. So we're about halfway through the Earth's lifespan, and certainly even opportunities for in, in the time scales that you were just and, the, and the, that you were just talking about that another species could certainly rise to the fore, and a whole other set of circumstances could happen before this planet uh, uh, goes through its own lifespan. So those are points well taken.